All right, so that's others. Okay. So today we're gonna class learn. six, right? Yeah. Today's class six, and we're gonna learn about how to create and use an ontology. It's today we'll learn about how to do it, and on Tuesday's lecture we'll actually create an ontology so that we can get real experience on how to do it instead of just listening to the theoretical stuff. So starting with the basics before learning about how to create and use an ontology, the basic thing is to understand what exactly an ontology is. So, ontology basically models a particular domain, like for example, healthcare or sports or cars, any domain of interest, so that we can infer stuff from it, the reason on it, and the best application is semantic search. If we have an ontology, we can use it for searching things on the web. You know, if you're using somebody else's slide, just say exactly whose slides. Who yeah, uh, this slide has been taken from the uh, Extended Semantical Conference 2004. Okay. Yes. And, and this is by Elena Sebra. Okay. Yeah, and so, ontology basically models the a particular domain of interest. It contains the entities of the domain and the relationships that exist between the entities like for example if you take the healthcare domain the entities in uh, in the domain would be like symptoms disorders medications and the type kinds of relationships that would be between the entities would be like symptom to disorder relation would be symptom causes a particular disorder so that exactly uh, of entity and the relationship are the two main uh, bit, are the two building blocks of your ontology. You can say that, like that. So the major uh, ontologies have been used in different areas of computer science, but named differently. Like, for example, taxonomies, semantic network classification, vocabulary. All they, they have different meanings, but ultimately they serve the same purpose in a different way. And so, well, so, so, uh, the, uh, you know, fundamentally, fundamental thing about ontology, at least as we are interested in the context of this information system, is about a representation of a domain. And often it is very hard to exactly define what the domain is. Yeah, you can say general term like domain of. Uh, e-commerce, you can say domain of uh, financial services, you can say domain of healthcare. Now healthcare is actually very vast, vast domain, so you can't actually have a single ontology anyway. But nevertheless, it is a, a model um, and a schema level information typically, and it is a set of facts, right? A concrete knowledge, instance level knowledge. So these are the two things that, uh, that, that are in the ontology. And we have different levels of knowledge representation that are possible. So simple uh, uh, would be a vocabulary, meaning these are the terms. Uh, that And they have some meaning. And that the meaning is agreed upon by its designer and users. That latter part is very critical. Otherwise, it is just a bunch of words. It is the latter part is called ontological commitment, meaning an agreement between the user of this ontology for shared interpretation. Right? So this is very critical. Now you can increase the complexity of knowledge representation. So you can go from taxonomy, uh, sorry, uh, uh, vocabulary to taxonomy, which would have hierarchical relationship, a tree structure to possibly a graph formalism, to possibly a, a richer uh, you know, pre, uh, model uh, and the, currently the most, you know, that happens to be the OWL language, the web ontology language, right? A slightly less richer is the RDFS, which we talked about in the previous form, right? So th there is a, um, you know, but RDF, as is based on graph kind of model, so it's that, and then you have constraints on the graph, and that becomes the uh, our language in principle. In each of the cases, 
uh, their knowledge representation and then you will call them potentially in ontology if you have that ontological commitment. So there's no guarantee that I just uh, design something um, just because I have designed something as a schema or in any knowledge represent format by itself won't become an ontology unless there is an agreement uh, for its shared interpretation, unless there is an ontology commitment. So it's very important. Often that is not safe, but that is an important thing to, thing to understand. Okay? Just like Dr. Shet said, the ontological commitment is the main, is plays a very crucial role because if I create an ontology and I and no one else com and no one else complies by the uh, vocabulary that I have created, the machine can't process the data, can't understand what kind of relationships are in it. It's basically you kind of useless. So there has to be an agreement on the terms used, the relationships used, and the axioms being specified, everything between the customer and the developers, obviously. Yeah. And if the ontology is developed in a uh, confirms to all these constraints, there is a very high possibility that we can re reuse the ontology because creating an ontology from the scratch is a very time consuming and tedious task. So so, so if you see here, this is a kind of um, talking about ontological commitment. Then if you see this here, there's an interesting statement here, making domain assumptions explicit. Um, in reality, it is seldom possible, if at all, that you can make something totally explicit as in totally formal, which is totally machine understandable accurately. So very often, there is a little leap of faith in saying that people will actually have the same meaning when you model something. Why? Because knowledge representation itself um, uh, is, um, has limitations. That the fact is that very often the knowledge that we talk about is in natural language. And it is in our own interpretation. And that any knowledge represent formalism, uh, for example, this our language, which is currently one of the more richer form of uh, representation of ontology, is a subset of so-called first order logic. And there are things like second order logic and so on and so forth. There are people, and it's just well understood that uh, it cannot represent all the knowledge in all the detail. Right? So um, there are only certain constraint types that you can do it because uh, there has always been this play between the richness of representation and the computability. So for example, the people who designed OWL uh, made certain explicit um, decision to limit its uh, uh, expressiveness so that they can get decent computational properties, right? And that is how, uh, uh, you know, so fundamental, you know, you go to the very basics of your data structure, there is this time and space trade-off, the same thing, expressiveness and computability trade-off, right? So that is that trade-off and people have made those choices. So in that, in that context is where people may choose to use, um, you know, one of the things we'll come back to is why do companies like Google don't use OWL as an example, right? So, uh, and we'll, we'll discuss that thing in uh, one of the future uh, classes. Um, and there, uh, and in fact, when I started my company, uh, you know, Tali in 1999, and then in fact, we have the first pattern for semantic web, you know, with semantic web in the title, we in the company internally, I, I had used RDF before that. I had paper in 1998 in the use of RDF and I known from the start of it. But uh, we did not exactly use RDF, but something very similar to that. But it clearly had subject, predicate, object, clearly had a graph structure. Right? So uh, people are making those kind of trade-offs. Every company saying, uh, because you know, search engine, uh, really needs the computation to be highly scalable because the amount of data they deal with, number of pages and annotations, metadata deal is massive, right? And then if they have to be stored, they have to store in any form that will uh, slow them down. That's not acceptable. So there are there's that those trade-offs are being made right now as we speak. And so hence, what has happened is that even though RDF became W3C standard, many of the companies currently are more focused on using generic graph model and graph data management systems. <coughs> right. So we'll go to that. Okay.
exactly that is because the complexity of owl owl process uh, inference reasoning using owl is very is computation heavy it cannot be done in real time like you suggested and making the domain assumptions explicit this can this has to be done because if we don't make the assumptions explicit different people have different ways of interpreting what we try to convey like i say something different people will interpret in a different way so we have to write axioms owl axioms rd axioms so that the assumptions can be made explicit have to be defined explicitly and yeah ontology is used in way not only in semantic web it is used in various other areas of computer science like machine learning natural language processing in natural language processing uh, ontologies can be used for naming entity recognition uh, using background knowledge like a if you see a term what exactly does the term refers to like doc, dr amit sheth teaches web 3.0 like what is dr amit sheth is a person is a course whatever so for that we can use ontology as a back, uh, yeah we can use ontology as a background knowledge and uh, for naming entity recognition and for machine learning we can use ontologies for feature extraction mm, yeah feature and there will be a lot of scope in it but i have i don't have much knowledge about it right now so comparing ontologies to the already ex like to the modeling languages or modeling languages that you familiar with right now uh you all might be familiar with er diagrams and entity relation uh, er schemas entity relationships schema ontologies are made so that they can be published reused and ontology share a common vocabulary and schemas are not necessarily meant to be published or reused they are defined for a particular application and it yeah it's not just a schema what so she's talking about here and then he's talking about er schema so er uh, is entity relationship model is a conceptual model right and the idea here is that um, we are talking about structured database representation uh, in the past, you know we, we had relational databases we still have them um, and uh, we need to be able to represent uh, uh, the uh, model of your database at a conceptual level uh, potentially with the graphical notations so er model gave you that but what you don't necessarily imply with the er model um, so er model typically in the schemas are conceptual representation of how the data is organized right in you know but they're not about um, but what ontology is about uh, is a standalone uh, thing meaning ontology is about agreement in us humans and other applications that use them as to what those terms mean and how they relate to each other it does not necessarily require or it, is, it does not even necessarily attempt to model a particular data structure or data representation in a computer uh, storage right so the, the 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 idea of schemas was to represent the structure of the data and er particularly gave a conceptual level of representation but this is all in the context of the database that it was trying to model ontology doesn't have to necessarily imply that right although ontology may have facts and that fact is you can say is a database or not if you typically you will call it knowledge is not database it's a knowledge right so it is knowledge based and you know you have your schema level description also <coughs> description aspect of the ontology also but the con concept but, but the meaning of that is not that i'm modeling a database i'm modeling a knowledge right and shared knowledge and um, uh, you know uh, and the okay and, you, and the statements are by the way referred to ontologies that are there your just so that you know what it means your diagrams are much more of a graphical representation of what the design of um, how do you say it this uh, they are much more of a graphical representation of the software program and ontology oh. yeah ontologies basically try to capture the knowledge so uml is just a more is just a graphical representation and this is actually what the data we 
the habit and means, like what are the relationships and all. Ontologies versus Thesaurus, I, I guess I'm spelling it correctly. Um, the basic, the most common example of a Thesaurus is WordNet. It is purely linguistic based and in WordNet basically sorts has synonymous uh, synsets. Synsets in the sense of all the terms which mean the same semantically, like for example, cat, dog, they all mean they all fall under the category of animals. They they all come under a certain same sin, sin set. But the problem with this is we cannot define relationships, custom relationships like like we can do in ontologies. There are a specific set of relationships which we, with which we have to work. But in ontologies, we can make custom relationships. And ontologies versus taxonomy. Taxonomy is basically a tree structure, and you know ontology is graph based. So, and we cannot capture all the uh, knowledge of the data. Uh, So fundamentally, these are all cross products of different choices in knowledge representation and whether you have ontological commitment or not. So in, in that context, you have all these variety of alternatives. Okay, you can go on this. Okay. So this is a guide on how to build an ontology written by Natalia F. Noy and Deborah. Deborah. Uh, the link will we post a link on G plus and it will be a very good starting point to learn on how to start building an ontology. But even though, so uh, what is interesting is that um, uh, I'll discuss with you earlier. Um, there was a blog post by um, uh, 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 Google's director. Um, the, he didn't believe in ontologies at all. Uh, and uh, I, my response to that, uh, this is in 2005. Um, uh, and um, uh, this is by a person who has written a very, very well known book on AI, Ethan um, and, uh, and I said, well, no, ontologies are useful for uh, search and such. And um, uh, interestingly, Natasha, uh, um, uh, who used to be at uh, Stanford uh, in biomedical informatics group, and Denny, another guy from Europe, who, um, uh, Google has hired them as ontologists now, right? So it's very interesting how uh, you know Google has bought into the concept of ontology. At least have uh, in at least on that their LinkedIn uh, their their uh, title is ontologist. So uh, at least for Denny, I saw that. So very interesting. So there is no hard and fast rule of how exactly to build an ontology, but this is just. Like I said, a rough draft, You there is no compulsion that you have to confirm by this process of building an ontology because it is much more rigid and we can build an ontology in a way that suits us, not confirming to anyone, any stated, there is no hard and fast rule. In it. And the first step is requirement analysis. We, the first thing that we need to know is what exactly is the domain that we need to model. We can model the health domain or something related to cars, but the broadness of the domain needs to be specified. Like if I'm saying I need to model the domain on cars, uh, and uh, car manufacturers and car insurance companies, the model is obviously going to be different. So if I say that I'm I want to model the domain of cars, the model will be different from if I say. The, I want to model car insurance companies so, because the entities would be different. If I'm modeling a domain of cars, I'll have manufacturers, the type of companies. Is this slide by Natasha and Debra? Yeah. Why is STI showing in the bottom? No, no, this is from Elena. She's following the one okay. on So the domain has to be explained. The broadness of the domain has to be specified and we need to think about it, about how, what exactly do we need to capture. <coughs> and 
major question is who is going what is the ontology going, going to do like what application will it serve is it just used for representation purposes or like i i worked in help <coughs> i've done my internship in ajdi and i worked in developing an ontology and it has multiple uses like shiva uses it for cdi and they are using it for on cdi is clinical document improvement and they have multiple applications like uh, computer assisted coding all of them are serve different purposes but the ontology they are using is the same for all next question is who will use the ontology who will use the ontology like the uh, our customers or some co coders who and while creating an ontology the basic thing that we need to do is that it cannot maybe i'm wrong when i'm saying this but according to me creation of an ontology cannot be automated completely maybe i'm wrong in this because if we automate the process of creating an ontology there has to be there will be errors in the relationships we capture maybe there will be errors in the entities that we capture and if there is an error even a single error in the ontology it's going to create a massive well, here is a philosophical note so what what do you um, why do you build ontology um, uh, ontro and what what does it have typically uh, or at least uh, my view is that uh, ontology is there to serve human needs and uh, it often uh, would capture the uh, uh, knowledge that humans have men a lot of knowledge that humans have may be already encoded because you may have write it and written down uh, in your paper you have encoded your knowledge you have actually represent the knowledge most of the time that knowledge is in unstructured form in natural languages in the publications you have so uh, you could potentially bootstrap ontology creation by mining uh, the uh, text for example or by using existing structured databases but typically that is not sufficient uh, and in that sense what others is saying that uh, ontology uh, cannot be uh, you know typically it would not be uh, all automated if you say that all my knowledge i need for a particular uh, uh, you know ontology for the scope of that ontology uh, is in this database then yes i can automate it but the point here is that the purpose of building this ontology is to serve the need of an application to serve the need of a community of its users and hence it cannot be uh, fully automated because there's a lot of things in human brain in your natural language each of them cannot be uh, totally automatically mined right so that's the idea and the other thing that other society was in, so the, one of the tricky part of the ontology design is the scope what does it what do you include and what do you exclude right and you, you when you say oh i have the, i have this is the domain ontology for alzheimer disease but are you going to you're going to include all the say physiological aspects of alzheimer disease but would you be including all the chemical aspects of uh, alzheimer disease is it only about neurological functions or uh, or behavioral aspects also as an example so what would it have right when you say um, uh, i'm doing financial service ontology is it about the stocks and how it is traded or it is about uh, uh, you know philosophical aspects of also uh, you know when is the right time to sell or, or, or a stock right so 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 the scope of the ontology you know deciding is a hard point a problem so the human has to be decision typically right what is in what is out and the human could be single human uh, or could be a collection of people who are uh, uh, basically um, uh and out with the you know decision making for ontological commitment they are going to say this is what i consider to be part of the ontology this is not exactly like like dr shet said there has to be a domain expert while creating the ontology because if you are mining like for example you your data so source of data is just plain pdf text then the prop the possible challenges we can find in getting the entities out of them would be simple uh, 
first of all name identity recognition would be a, a massive problem we can like they might have uh, mentioned uh, how do you say it? they might have meant they, the, a sentence might be referring to a particular topic but uh, the algorithm might think that it is referring to a, another topic altogether like entity design something related to entity disambiguation so there have we need there has to be a human in the loop while creating an ontology otherwise there is a very high like there is almost a very high possibility that there is we'll encounter a wrong relationship and that one wrong relationship can lead to a massive havoc in the ontology while reasoning or while inferring there will be a problem <coughs> if we do try to automate it all together and so yeah So that's the introduction for the ontologies. So let us let us get into uh, how do you design ontologies? What are the critical factors that you consider when you uh, design on? Let me skip these two slides. Uh, so here, uh, so ontologies can be designed in uh, two different ways. One is to represent the domain, and one is to uh, 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 for a particular task. Uh, represent uh, so. If you guys know about ontologies like Go ontology and actually Go ontology is gene ontology. Yeah, gene ontology and uh, there are like bunch of other things. Uh, yeah, so the gene ontology and uh, there are like bunch of things on that bio portal where they try to represent a particular domain. So. Uh, when they designed a gene or when they did not have a very particular task uh, to do that, but to uh, but to represent the the, the, the domain, like uh, what are the genes and uh, uh, how do we define the uh, interaction between the genes and uh, actually it has chemicals and all these other things too. So they didn't have any particular uh, task on uh, this is why we are uh, designing. It's, in that case, what you are basically interested in is Am I covering the, the domain uh, uh, accurately uh, for, so that uh, people will understand from the uh, from the ontology and whether the ontology can be reused for a one uh, maybe the whole ontology or the or the subset of ontology can be used for a particular task. So the other type of the ontologies are the task oriented ontologies where you have a particular requirement uh, to re represent the domain and uh, use that particular uh, particular ontology. For a particular task. So, for example, uh, so I can basically describe two different uh, types of tasks. One is, let's say, uh, if I call what the Google is developing this knowledge based, right? So, if you consider that, so they don't really uh, their purpose is to understand that uh, the web text, right? In that case, what they are interested in is, okay, can I understand these entities rather than those as keywords and what are the tags associated with uh, those things? So that people will search when people search for some entities, they can list down other uh, related facts. So that they, the basic task is to understand that as entity, then uh, uh, somebody as a person, something as an event, something like that. So that they can provide more information. So, so that's a one one particular task of that. So no reason associated, nothing is associated, just to uh, uh, represent what they are in the text. And the other thing would be like okay. It's a more advanced task, a uh, 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 little bit of formalism is involved, saying that, okay, I'm designing ontology to reason over that. Uh, for, particular, for example, uh, let's say take the, uh, the domain of healthcare, where, uh, so let's say uh, the doctors this, uh, write those notes, right? So they <coughs> specify particular medications. Let's say a patient is taking um, metaprol or let's say something like that, right? Uh, but uh, these things, like in the domain, somebody can ask questions like, okay, uh, who are the patients who are taking beta, uh, beta blockers for a particular condition, right? So beta blockers, the term beta blocker not, was not in the, uh, uh, the patient's document, but instance of that or a type of beta blocker was there. So uh, in that case, we can use these ontologies, the representative knowledge to infer that, okay, metaprol is a beta blocker so that the, the answer for this query should uh, the this document is also qualified for the uh, the, uh, the the quiz and the quiz. There is an interesting thing I would like to add in the importance of the ontology, and this is a kind of thing. For example, uh, what, uh, what uh, companies like Google did not earlier care for, but now they do, is that um, 
uh, suppose you use a statistical method, it's possible that you can uh, uh, learn uh, that when you use this particular um, uh, you know, medication, that somewhere the type of medication it is, like beta blocker is a type of medication, but a particular instance of the medication is, uh, I, again, I don't know the instance now, name, right? Uh, or I would say, for example, I have uh, ibuprofen and, and I have uh, Advil, right? So Advil is the uh, brand name, uh, ibuprofen is the, uh, uh, you know, particular generic uh, thing. Now, um, if you analyze all the data and understand, try to understand bottom up, what is the relationship between ibuprofen and, um, uh, uh, you know, Advil, uh, you might find that they are related because somehow they come up uh, together often, but exactly how they are related is very hard to know. Right? There, there why the main relationship that you have in the concept, concepts here being Edwin and Ali, both of them are concepts, both of them are entities, and you have relationship. The relationship happens to be that Edwin is a brand name of a drug of type ibuprofen. Right? Now, that specific relationship is extremely hard to find automatically through a bottom-up process of data, especially through statistical or machine learning processing. Now, in the context of machine learning, if you're given enough training set, you could learn that, uh, like you have said that Edwin is uh, ibuprofen, then potentially you can find another example of that. But then the original knowledge that this is uh, ibuprofen was given as part of training set by a human who created a training set, or a database that was cleaned by human used as a training set, right? And and th thereby, what is happening here is the example that Sujan was giving. That you know, suppose somebody wants to do data mining, saying, "Give me all the patients who are getting ibuprofen." And even if the patient had mentioned, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the uh, EMR, electronic medical record document, may mention uh, Edwill or the other brand names of ibuprofen. Uh, including Kirkland, uh, you know, ibuprofen and this and that. That um, the system, uh, in the case you had used explicitly no explicit knowledge base, when you have ontology, you would be able to create, create uh, formulate the query, ibuprofen can be Advil, can be this, can be that. But if you use uh, machine learning, how are you going to formulate the explicit queries of that kind? You can possibly say, well, give me also other terms that, you know, in the lower rank results would be where it does not exactly say ibuprofen, it says Edwin because Edwin happens to, happens to occur when ibuprofen occurs, right? So in one case, this is called implicit knowledge. And, uh, you know, uh, that you may possibly get through statistical and machine learning, uh, you know, techniques. In the case of knowledge representation, we are trying to represent what I call explicit knowledge, right? And then there are advantages and disadvantages. And the only disadvantage is that you have to have put in that effort to create that knowledge base or ontology. Advantages are many right? But now that they understand that advantages, they are also uh, extensively building this so-called Google Knowledge Graph and Vault and, and many others are doing that. Microsoft is doing something similar. Yahoo has so-called concept base and, and they are trying to improve their search. Yeah, so they say that uh you are given a task of uh, designing an ontology, uh, let's say for a particular task. Uh, so what, how do you how do you get into this, right? How do you where to start it? So first of all, I think uh, uh, the first I think most of you guys have designed at least uh, um, database schemas, right? So in that case, you ask your questions yourself. Okay, what are the queries? What are the SQL queries that I'm going to support in here? Uh, and how do I optimize such uh, the frequent queries uh, in the schema and all these things, right? In the same way, like uh, when you do the ontology design, okay, uh, if it is for a particular task, you uh, you basically need to answer the the questions like what are the particular questions that uh, my ontology or the the, the database the data that I'm representing with the ontology should be asked should be able to answer, and. Uh, uh, so we call this as a, a computational questions. Uh, it's the the set of com uh, computational questions are different from uh, domain to domain and task to task. Basically, you need to figure out okay uh, with the domain. So normally, how this happens is uh, uh, somebody who knows how to design the ontology and somebody who knows the domain and the task, right? So 
you get together and ask, okay, uh, what are the questions that you need to answer from the, the ontology and uh, those kind of things, and then figure out, okay, uh, these are the things that I need to answer, and then how to design the ontology uh, based on that, uh, uh, considering the optimization, considering the representation, considering the accuracy, and considering the coverage, and all these kind of things. Okay, so this is, uh, so basically this slide set uh, uh, follows the ontology 101 tutorial, which is from the Stanford. Uh, this is the well-known guide for the uh, ontology design. Uh, so this, uh, th uh, in, the, in the tutorial, they are designing ontology for the Y. Uh, so basically to represent the Y domain. So these are the configurations that they came up with, okay, with my knowledge base, uh, with my representation of the, uh, the Y, these are the questions that I'm going to answer. So the schema should be able to answer, so you, you guys know the Sparker, right? Uh, I think you had a, a class. So basically the, uh, the queries that we run on uh, uh, ontology uh, can be on Sparkle or can be on, uh, on OWL. Uh, so you, uh, you, you, decide, you decide, okay, uh, my thing is Sparkle, okay, then how to optimize that for the Sparkle queries? Uh, and then, uh, so this this can be another set of frequencies. Those are not computer situations. Okay, my ontology should be bilingual. I should support at least two two languages. And I am not expecting to develop ontology which has ten level of things. It is going to be a very uh, complex thing, right? So ten levels means uh, the hierarchy. Uh, and so such kind of uh, uh, restrictions. You put yourself and then uh, go for the uh, design the ontology. Uh, so if you take the ontologies like gene ontology, those are very complex ontologies. And it's very difficult to visualize, it's very difficult to understand. What they have is the text format that you have and you have to kind of have some previous knowledge about the ontology to uh, get the uh, stuff out from, the, uh, from that ontology because it's a very huge thing. So that's again, uh, I would say it's a disadvantage. I think there should be some modularization on uh, when you design something like that. Having said all of all these things, uh, when you're given a task of designing an ontology, don't should not start with designing it. Uh, you should uh, search for <laughs> what are the existing things because designing ontology is not an easy task. It is time consuming. It is uh, with time it comes with the cost and everything. So uh, I think. Uh, for most of the things, at, uh, if you just search for in the Google, you will find at least a, pr a primitive ontology uh, so that you can start with. Uh, this is very true for the domain of uh, biomedical, healthcare, uh, those kind of things. People have developed like hundreds of uh, ontologies representing different aspects of the uh, domain. So this is the that's the bio. Okay, I think I got it. Yeah, here they have uh, a whole bunch of uh, uh, things, uh, domain, different aspects of the uh, the same domain, medical, dom the biomedical, healthcare, those kind of things, represented as uh, ontologies. Okay. So the dominant ones are like SNOMED, I think, most of you guys are kind of heard about that. The SNOMED, yeah, you can, yeah, they represent the uh, terminology on the healthcare, the uh, diseases, symptoms, drugs, procedures, anatomical structures, all these things, and a uh, bunch of uh, relationship between them. And so I wouldn't really go into design ontology if it is on biomedical or, or, or healthcare because you can always start with uh, existing ones. And uh, so here are like few uh, well-known uh, ontologies. Uh, uh, WordNet, if you call it ontology, uh, it's, uh, it's, the, it's the linguistic uh, uh, ontology that it has synonyms, hyponyms, antonyms, and the different formation of the same uh, uh, terms. And people use this thing for all the like natural language processing guys, machine learning. Everybody uses uh, this WordNet thing for. Uh, so all the problems. Okay, the free base is the the first version of uh, Google Knowledge Graph. This is the one they started with. So these these are facts. Like uh, they have uh, 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 
the knowledge base, they are they identified the uh, relationship between uh, different categories of the term, uh, different categories of the entities, and uh, uh, represented them as a, uh, they don't really use any uh, formal languages for representing this, but uh, in the in the in the graph format. So these are few such ontologies. So let us get into. We kind of discuss these things. Okay, uh, this is again recapping requirement analysis. Uh, okay. Uh, so when you start the when you if you let's say you didn't find any ontology for your particular task and you are supposed to uh, develop one from scratch, so you. You should start that with okay. List down all the things that comes into your mind uh, in terms of uh, entities in your domain and in, uh, in the relationship in your domain, and first first get that list down, and then uh, try to identify uh, the entities and the relationships separately, and then uh, the next task is to find the relationship between those entities. Uh, the relationships can be hierarchical relationships, saying that okay, this is a type of that. Or can be a domain relationship, saying that okay, this uh, affects something else. Um, so, so uh, and then uh, you can actually go uh, top down or bottom up. Uh, but naturally, to me, uh, top down is the way it works. But uh, can, can be a hybrid version too, saying that okay, I'm starting with wine. And then uh, these are the different types of wine, but uh, you might forget one level on that. That sense, uh, then you figure out okay, there's a one more up, one level up, so that again you go uh, from bottom uh, bottom up. Uh, so basically, it's it's uh, there's no standard hard and fast rule saying that okay, you start from that and go uh, should go like that. But uh, whatever works for you, uh, depending on always this is this is kind of a Software engineering task, so it's always changing. Uh, the task is always changing. The requirements are also changing. So uh, that's ha having a hard and you can't we can't have a hard and fast rules on that. So uh, when you design such things, uh, so the ontology consists of uh, the classes and the relationships, right? So typically classes are uh, entities in the real world. So a car can be an entity, but it can't be a relationship in the in the in the in the domain. So uh, so classes and relationships are kind of uh, <coughs> obvious to uh, uh, decide on. But when it comes to say that whether something is a class or something is an instance, then you might have the same problems as uh, uh, when you do the software engineering uh, design, right? So let's say. Uh, I'm, def I'm developing an uh, uh, ontology for the development <coughs> of vehicles, right? So probably I'll start with vehicle, and then I'll say four wheels, three wheels, and two wheels, and then under four wheels I'll come with lorry, uh, car, and all these things. And when I'm defining the domain of vehicle, car is a, uh, car is a vehicle, right? But uh, how about uh, uh, BMW? Again, Will you categorize BMW under car as a as a ESA relationship? So let's say we started with the uh, vehicle, and you can have four wheels. Right under let's say under uh, four wheels we had car. Right, so uh, so. Does BMW is BMW is a car or uh, will you say that uh, so all all these uh, arrows right you represent you pronounce them as is car is a vehicle uh, car is four wheel vehicle four wheel four wheels is a is a vehicle right so does the uh, would you say BMW is a car sorry no it's a car it's a car yeah it's tricky right so I think when you decide on these kind of things so if you poorly take the domain, BMW is not a car, right? it's a brand. Right? 
So it's a car, it's a brand of a car, right? So you, I can't say BMW. Is, normally you say that, but in the domain, the philosophical sense, it's not a, a, a car, right? So these kind of decisions, uh, depending on what, if, if you are designing your thing for a particular task, and uh, having a BMW as a car in your particular domain and particular task optimizes your query, go for it, right? But uh, uh, but if you are designing that for an ontological <laughs> commitment and all those things, people might not agree with your uh, decision on saying that BMW is a car, right? It's, it's a brand. So that's the tricky part of saying whether I'm designing ontology for a particular task or a particular domain, a represent the particular domain. Uh, so another uh, another example that I can give on this slide, uh, when I was uh, doing uh, some design for uh, for the healthcare domain, we had the problem of saying that okay, so I had a, a, a class called let's uh, say uh, heart failure. So I had the. Uh, uh, so the concept it has heart failure, right? So in particular task that I was working on, what I want to do is query for the patients who has, uh, people can give uh, different parameters <coughs> for, uh, query for the patient. So in, uh, in poor sense, heart failure is a particular uh, disease, right? So, but uh, the heart failure from patient one to patient two is different. Mm -hmm. Right? So the heart failure that patient 1 has maybe have a different characteristics and the patient 2 has different characteristics. So even though I have one heart failure, so when you, when you think in the domain wise, heart failure is one thing. But when you go into the data level, actually it is multiple things. Uh, when you re try to represent the, uh, the uh, heart failure of different patients. So uh, this has different characteristics and the, uh, the characteristics of the patient to patient is different. So in that case, I had to design heart failure as a uh, it has it, it has an instance. Say that okay, this is different from that, and that is different from that. I couldn't say that uh, I cannot group all these patients and say that all these are heart failure patients because I I needed to differentiate between this guy's heart failure and that guy's heart failure. So those kind of things matters, and it's depending on the task and. Uh, and what you are trying to do and what are the queries that you are trying to uh, answer based on your schema that you have to uh, take such decisions. So, okay. uh, so, uh, so once, you, once you have the, uh, the set of terms that you are trying to dis uh, define on your domain, and then you find out uh, the relationship between these, uh, these uh, uh, entities, whatever the, the terms that you came up with. Those relationships can be typically, uh, the first thing is the hierarchy, where you say this is, this is a something, something like car is a vehicle, uh, something like that. And then other thing can be the part of relationship. Uh, and. Uh, from there onwards, those, those can be domain relations. Like, uh, let's say in the in the in the healthcare domain, I can say, uh, a, a shortness of breath is a, a symptom of heart failure. So the symptom of, of is the relationship, which we call domain relationship. Those are not hierarchical or anything, right? So you need to find out okay, what the, the relationship that I'm trying to, what are the relations that I, I need to represent on the on the ontology. Uh, and then uh, represent them. So, yeah, and then uh, uh, apart from relationships, there's something called uh, attributes, right? So the properties, you can define uh, relationships and attributes as properties. The difference between the relationships and attributes are, uh, let's say, I'm trying to model a person, and then I can uh, person has a birth date, right? So I can define uh, that as uh, like this. So I have a person. So. 
So a person has a, uh, it's a property of uh, a birth date. So this property I can represent that as a regular relationship, relationship or attribute. Meaning, I can have a, another class which actually represent the birth date, uh, uh, a class of birth date. And I can also have this as a data type, right? So I can, I, I, I really don't need to that, have that as a class. I can say, uh, let's say I have person P1, and then I can say uh, as birth date, um, something like that, right? So the the languages that we we will be representing the knowledge uh, the ontologies are the RDF, RDFs, and OUT. So these uh, languages support these data types and the operations on those data types. So basically, you can say whether this date is before that or those kind of things. Uh, so another choice that I have is to represent that as a, a birth date as a class. And then say this has a uh, year, uh, month, date, and so on, right? So in that case, what uh, what will happen is the the properties that are defined on these data types, I have to define on my class, right? So those are the decisions that you have to uh, take depending on if you have a, a, a requirement to do the operations on the data type then I would go with the data type uh, rather than going into complex uh, uh, class representation of that. Uh, so that's about the properties. So to summarize, there are two, two different types of properties, uh, the attributes and relationships. And uh, to some, some, sometimes it's, tri uh, it's tricky to uh, identify whether something is an attribute or I should define that as a relationship. So that's again based on the what you want to do with your uh, data representation. Uh, so when you design the ontology, right? So we are we are basically de designing uh, some knowledge. So in that case, we, we have constraints on on the knowledge. So one kind of constraint is the domain and range. So let's say in in particular this particular case, I have a, a relationship called has birth date and. Uh, I know that uh, I, uh, the left hand side of that should be a person and right hand side uh, that can be uh, depending on what I decided or uh, it can be the this class instance of that class or a data type. So I can define those things as the domain is the what you have on the left I can say as birth date should have the domain of person and as birth date should have the range of uh, uh, let's say date data. So we can do those kind of things, and then we can do uh, cardinality, saying that uh, let's say uh, in uh, when I, when I, whenever I'm designing the healthcare domain, I would say I am not going to represent the uh, uh, I'm not going to give let's say uh, one disease cannot have more than five symptoms, just five related, right? So I can say some, something like that, and then. What is interesting is I can all uh, I can again say uh, <coughs> I can always give a, a few uh, rich relationships on on the relationships. So let's say these are kind of known things, but. It's, uh, we need to be aware that we can do these things on OWL and all these things. So let's say uh, the particular domain relationships can have its own properties rather than the domain and the relationships. So some some of these relationships can be uh, transitive, some of them can be symmetric and those kind of things. So to define what those things are, so I think transitive we kind of know, right? So if, uh, for example, uh,
Okay, so I can say uh, somebody has ancestor B. Uh, sorry, uh, somebody has uh, an, it, person A has ancestor B, and person B has ancestor C. Then obviously A has ancestor C, right? So we can define these properties as transitive so that uh, when you uh, do the reasoning on that and you just represent in your knowledge, in your data level, you just represent A to A to B and B to C and we can infer that A to C. So those are actually defined as properties of this relationship. The, the properties, uh, this is one kind of property and you can always have, uh, you can say some of them are symmetric relationships meaning that uh, a is a spouse of B, that means actually B is a spouse of A, right? So this is the, the kind of the implicit knowledge that you will derive from the, uh, by, uh, by representing your domain, your knowledge as a formal, uh, formal way, right? So, and uh, yeah, there are uh, six different uh, uh, relations, uh, properties that you can define on the on the relation uh, on the uh, relationship. So one again, uh, one other thing. This is a different kind of thing where you can say a uh, as husband b, and let's say and another thing said a has c. Then probably b and b is equal to c, right? So these kind of things you can uh, define on your uh, knowledge base. So kind of act as uh, restrictions on the on the on the knowledge, and still you can and again you can uh, derive implicit knowledge on that. And so those are the fundamental things. So the fundamental things are uh, to defect to de uh, develop knowledge. You should figure out. The question that you are trying to answer, and then what's the the domain, uh, the entities or the relationship that you are trying to cover, and uh, then what are the restrictions on that you want to apply on that, and uh, going beyond that uh, is the there's this thing called design patterns. Uh, I think you guys are familiar with the programming design patterns, the software engineering design patterns. Same here. So they have uh, 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 patterns defined for reoccurring uh, uh, the problems. Uh, so they have this thing called uh, ontology design pattern .org, I guess. Yeah, where they define a set of uh, design patterns. Yeah, so here are the design patterns that they have come up with. So actually, some of the, these things are old, and what happened was uh, uh, those the, the problems that they have this defined uh, the the design these this design patterns are actually removed from the language itself, and some of them are uh, introduced as features for the language so that you. Uh, you don't need the, the to design that intentionally in the in the when you uh, do uh, those kind of things. One of uh, such examples are the I think uh, the verification you guys had went through, right? So earlier they didn't have that, uh, so you have to do that on your own. Uh, but then they introduced the the feature of verification, and then they are going beyond that. Now that is included in the language itself. So if you go through these things, you might, if you know a little bit of RDF and this kind of thing, you might figure out, okay, this I can do a much better way with the RDF. But let me go through uh, one example here. So this is a <coughs> typical way that uh, one would define uh, a scenario where you say, okay, so I have object, 
and I need to uh, define that object as uh, uh, which it has a different uh, whole thing of different things. Like let's say I have an object A, and it is it has parts B, C, and D, and this is part of relationship. And I want to say that. I want to say that A is not B, A is not C, A is com uh, A contains A, B, C, uh, sorry, B, C, D, right? So in that case, uh, this is the typical way that they do that. Uh, this is my A, and that's the class I'm going to uh, define. And these are the different components of A. And you say, okay, uh, union of all these things equivalent to my particular class, and then all these things are destroyed. So, some, so something like this, like they came up with uh, standard solutions for uh, typical frequently occurring uh, patterns uh, when you define the uh, when you try to uh, design a, a, a knowledge base. And uh, another example would be here. Yeah, this is again. So here somebody is trying to say Sam is a CEO of IBM. Okay, this is the uh, the uh, main triple, and uh, I don't want to represent that Sam is uh, CEO of IBM. Actually, it is somebody somebody believes that is the CEO of IBM, right? So uh, again. Uh, if you are familiar with the reification, uh, they do that with the reification. But before that, this is what they have done. Okay, uh, uh, so they define something called context for the triple. Okay, and then and then said that context is somebody believes on that. Right. So that is represented as so this triple actually is not really a fact, but it is somebody uh, believes in that. So. Uh, to do that in a different way, you can say uh, mm, that the key here is when you do the uh, inferencing on this kind of knowledge bases, you should not derive that as a fact. Sam is a CEO of IBM, right? It it is not a, a conclusion on that uh, knowledge base. So do that on a different way uh, by using poor RDF. Uh, uh, I would do Chris, which is a uh, believes yes. and uh, here I'm using uh, what is called the reification. Say that let's say. So this is one way I can do that. Somebody believes in something, and that something has subject Sam, a predicate uh, CEO, and object IBM. Right. So this will not derive you as Sam uh, is CEO of IBM. Right. So this is the way of uh, doing that. But one when you do something like this, then you cannot really have those properties like uh, cement. If uh, uh, the transitivity, symmetry, reflexivity, those things defined on this uh, relationship because it is not a relationship anymore in this particular representation, right? So that is the disadvantage here. You cannot have any any properties on that. As a result of that, you cannot do much reasoning on that. But this is a little bit better way of doing that. But I don't know how they really uh, restrict 
you are reasoning thing to not to derive something like this when you have the same representation. Yeah, I don't know how exactly formally you reason. Yeah, that is because uh, you cannot really say that when you reason on that, consider this. It's it's a it's a again. Then you have to do the uh, your own implement your own rule on the uh, the standard reasoning thing. So this will not do that. This will work on the standard our reasoning on uh, on top of our, our reasoning and will not derive the standard C of IBM. So these are the. That's uh, those are uh, design patterns you can go through uh, uh, those things, and uh, I think there are like different books written on orderly design patterns, a uh, bunch of them, and there's another concept called WOCAMP that I think they also have a, a site. So we can. Yeah, so they come up with different uh, design patterns and different things to uh, standards to define ontologies and publish. On that. Uh, so the another thing that I would like to touch upon is uh, a well-known ontology is called DBpedia. <coughs> so, so ontologies can be defined on uh, people can work on that, and knowledge uh, the experts can work on that and define the the knowledge base. And uh, but. Uh, you know, Wikipedia is the uh, the dominant knowledge base that people have ever designed, right? So that's the unstructured version of the that's the un unstructured knowledge what you have in Wikipedia. So you have to go and read it and understand it. So what people have done is uh, it has some structure. Yeah, uh, yeah. The Wikipedia pages has some structure. So basically. To develop this particular ontology, which is called DBpedia, they basically leverage that structure on the Wikipedia pages and uh, try to try to represent whatever the the facts on the Wikipedia pages as facts, the structured uh, facts as triples. So the result was the uh, DBpedia ontology, where I think the, yeah here. So they have very shallow schema on that. Uh, this is the ontology. Uh, uh, very shallow schema on that uh, the hierarchy and they have the relationships too but what is interesting here is so you can say <coughs> and they have this uh, uh, represented uh, that as an entity and uh, the uh, the facts of the entity are represented as structured uh, data where you have property and the value. So subject is always Barack Obama here, and then the uh, property uh, and the value. So you can go through here like activities. And so all these things actually extracted from the Wikipedia page. So it's a it's a automatic way of doing that. But uh, again, this is not the ontology that is designed for reasoning or do any formal uh, uh, thing on that. So this is again for browsing, for understanding the text that uh, it will not give you, uh, always it's not guaranteed to give you 100% of accuracy for whatever the task <coughs> you're working on. Yours, it's, 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 uh, but this is a much better way of doing that because they are basically leveraging the structured portion of the uh, Wikipedia pages. So uh, mining structured portion of the Wikipedia is much 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 accurate than doing that from the unstructured portion of that. So, uh, yeah, here for each entity that is in Wikipedia, there is an entry on uh, Wikipedia. This is like the, I would say this is the the biggest ontology that uh, knowledge base that they have uh, defined because we don't know what's the size of the Google knowledge graph for uh, activities, right? So, this is the publicly available. Uh, general knowledge uh, about uh, and uh, represented as a structured uh, way so that semantic people can use that. Mm. Uh, so 
Are there two things that you uh, like to know about is, uh, let's say now you have an ontology. So it's not that you design ontology in a six months and it's done, right? So it's always the case that it's been uh, updated and uh, you need to change, right? <coughs> so the ontology evolution is a different task, different topic, and there's a different track of research on that. Uh, so, but uh, there are few frameworks available for that where uh, those frameworks are capable of uh, identifying uh, the, the, the concepts on the ontology uh, that are not being used for uh, some time and they suggest, okay, just get rid of that, but, uh, and then it can say, okay, uh, I am seeing this particular thing on the text when you do the annotation very frequently, but I don't have a thing on the knowledge base to, uh, on the ontology to represent that. So you might uh, uh, better uh, find out uh, whether actually there's a concept and should be added to the ontology. So those kind of uh, things are there uh, to maintain the ontologies. And then uh, uh, to uh, another question that people ask is, how do you say that whatever the ontology that you design is accurate, is, is good enough, is uh, uh, covers everything, those kind of things. I really don't have a particular answer for that, but uh, as long as, so two different types, right? One is if your, if your knowledge base, if your ontology is intended to uh, represent the domain, it's a never ending process, right? So, but if it is for a particular task, I would say as long as your task your uh, queries are answered by the uh, the knowledge base, the ontology, and your reason, reasoning is going uh, is uh, doing with good uh, performance. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, the ontology is good enough. Other than that, I'm not, I don't know how to say that uh, whether ontology is accurate, doing well, and all those things. Uh, apart from subject to whatever you are uh, you are doing on the ontology. Uh, yeah, that is about the ontologies, and uh, I think Dr. Prasad, Dr. Seth has posted some stuff on the, the page, and you might need to go through. Uh, basically, I recommend the 101 tutorial to go through. And the other thing that I want to uh, cover here is the next Tuesday class, we'll try to uh, work on uh, designing ontology. Uh, and uh, for that, I would request you guys to have your laptops with you and install a Protege. Excuse me. Yeah. You give us the link. It's a Portage file. Uh -huh. Actually, Portage, uh, port, uh, Portage uh, for was uh, working, but the link which you give us uh, never worked. Can you please just try how we can install it? Protege. Yeah, this one it it's working, but your link, okay. it one version was higher, but I no, couldn't I think I yesterday installed four or two. Yeah, four I think is okay. Install this thing today. You are talking about the link is not. Yeah. Working? Well, mine was uh, Windows 64. Okay. I just wanted. It didn't work. Didn't work. I tried to install in uh, Noises Lab here, so it didn't work. Okay. So, as a general comment, uh, try to install the the version with Java. With yeah. Java, uh, and uh, choose your version and try to install it in, uh, before uh, Tuesday and uh, resolve all your technical problems because if it is technical problem, the class will be on technical problems, right? So um, if you face any problems, either talk to the others or me, I, we are in 376. Uh, and please uh, get ready with this thing uh, on Tuesday so that we can actually work on something and uh, 
get hands on how to use the Protegi. But Protegi it's getting a virtual, tool. right? It's Sorry? a virtual box. It's like a virtual box. It won't get installed, right? It's it's installed. It's installed? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because mine is working via version 4, but it's like a virtual box. 